Hey, what's going on, guys? This is Dion, and this is officially my first episode of my new podcast called I'm Always Right. Because I'm always right, this is strictly a sports podcast. Maybe we'll talk about a few other things, but for the most part, it'll be about sports. The main things I'm into, MLB, NBA, college basketball, college football, and NFL as well. So without further ado, let's just jump right into a few topics. I usually, what I'm usually going to do, I'm going to start off with maybe some little notes for whatever sports not, like, peaking right now. So, like, MLB's just starting right now. The NFL is still in the off-season process. We haven't even had the draft or anything like that yet. So, most parts, if there's some interesting news going on in those sports, I'll just talk about that. But, really, there hasn't been much notes to really talk about. MLB season, we're only about two weeks in. Nothing crazy has happened. I like a few directions. My team is going, which is the Yankees. Gary Sanchez on the four-week DL or whatever. Um, but we're not going to talk too much about that. I did also see, just to harp on the NFL t- uh, subject, also I read something not too long ago. Uh, Oakland and Seattle is working on a trade for, Mar- for Marshawn Lynch. So that's pretty interesting. But, man, you guys see the you guys see the avatar for this episode. It's all about the NBA playoffs, and we have some some pretty nice matchups. We're going to also talk about the awards. I'm not quite sure which one I should do first, but, hey, we're just going to jump into talking about some of the awards. The first, if for me, the rookie of the year, we're going to start with rookie of the year. It's a few options. You have Malcolm Brogdon. You have Joel Embiid. You have Dario Saric. And I think it's pretty much, it was just, in bet- it was just between those two, uh, between those three guys. But for me... Joel Embiid didn't play enough games. He was pretty much, he had it locked up. If he would have just played at least 60 games, he has it locked up. But he missed most of the season. Uh, he would even play 50%. Maybe even 50% I might have gave it to him. And then um, you have Dario Saric, who's been balling ever since he since Joel Embiid went down. But the Sixers aren't winning enough games. So by default, I have to give it to a guy that's contrib- contributing to a playoff team. And that will be Malcolm Brogdon. His stats aren't eye-popping or anything. It's pretty much, he's probably like the fourth option on the team. You go Giannis, you go Middleton, you go um, Greg Monroe. And then the fourth spot is probably a toss-up between, I guess, a Beasley or uh, or Malcolm Brogdon. And Beasley doesn't really play that many minutes. So we'll just say Brogdon's the fourth option. But uh, for the season, he's averaging 10 points, 4 assists. And my biggest thing... When I determine a lot of these awards, when I can't, when the stats are close and the team record, you know, kind of shifts things, I like to go for who has more moments. And to me, like, Sarek's numbers might be better, but Brogdon just has the moments. He has the moments. He hit the uh, the dagger against the Celtics. Um, he dunked on LeBron and Kyrie. And just those, just plays like that, man, a signature moment, so. Uh, I'm get, I'm definitely giving the rookie of the year rookie of the year to Malcolm Brogdon. He deserves it. I think he's most likely gonna win it. It'll probably be anonymous. So uh, I got him winning it. Uh, Coach of the year we have Mike D'Antoni. The Rockets pretty much overachieved. I don't think anybody had them being a three uh, top three seed in the NBA. I'm not even just saying the West in the NBA because right now it's the Warriors number one, Spurs two, and Rockets have the third best record. So. Uh, that's pretty impressive seeing that a lot of these teams have what at least two two stars. Not e- they might not be superstars, but they have at least two stars. And then you look at the Rockets after James Harden, he's a superstar. We know that, but I don't even they don't have another star. They have a bunch of role players, even though they're good. They're a good system fit for you know Mike D'Antoni style. He still got them playing above, playing the way above average. So you got to give it to them. They were fifty five and twenty seven on the season. I don't think anybody had them winning 50 games, especially with that roster. But uh, James Harden elevated that team. Mike D'Antoni, Mike D'Antoni did a great job of coaching them. And they're a top three seed in the in the West. So pretty impressive there. You got to give it to him. The only other person I would have probably gave it to, if these guys would have snuck into the playoffs, I would have gave it to... I would have gave it to uh, Eric Spolstra of the Miami Heat, man. But uh, fortunately, the Brooklyn Nets just... Uh, just, just help the, just help keep them out a little bit. So, uh, can't give it to our exposure if your team doesn't even make the playoffs. But that would have been tough. That would have been a great feat because I think at one point in the beginning of the season, 
Like probably like the first two months, they were like eight games below 500 or 10 games below 500. And to see these guys pretty much just peak at the right moment. They went on one point. I think they went like on a 12 game win streak. Then they almost got into the playoffs. They missed by one game. And then uh, Deion Waiters missed like what the last two or three weeks of the season, and I know the Heat could have probably won some extra games there if he was healthy. So, and you would have, and I think I probably would have thought about giving it to Spoelstra, man, because he did a lot with with less. So, uh, for right now, Mike D'Antoni's the coach of the year, in my opinion. Next, we have the six man of the year. I'm giving it to Lou Williams. A few of the other guys you could have thought about: Eric Gordon, uh, somebody I know as a dark horse. They would have said James Johnson. Uh, who else could we give the six man? I think, yeah, honestly, I think it's just between those guys. Oh yeah, probably Iguodala because Durant missed a lot of missed a lot of games, and Iguodala stepped up huge in those moments, especially when they were losing. Then they went on that little thirteen game win streak without Durant, so that's pretty impressive. And Nick and Andre Iguodala was pretty much balling in those games, but I just don't feel like he had the the same impact as a Lou Will, even though Lou Will, I. Lou Will wasn't playing for a winning team for the most part, but he's a, he's part of the reason. Like, he was playing so good helping the Lakers win games that they said, nah, we have to trade this guy because he's helping us win too many games. And we we can't just keep a talent like this on the bench. Like, it's not, it's not going to sit well with him. So they moved him to Houston. And I think he's still he's still he's still playing good, man. His first game there, he had like thirty points or something like that. So just set the tone off the bench in his first game. That just lets you know what kind of player he is. Uh, he's taking over a few games. The and to me, it's really between Lou Will. It's really between Lou Will and Eric Gordon. But what what made me give it to Lou Will is Eric Gordon. I think he started about sixteen games. Lou Will started one game, and then um. I'm just looking at shooting percentages. Lou Will shooting 44%. Eric Gordon shooting 40 So that was pretty much the tiebreaker for me. The shooting percentage. And then he didn't really start any games. And Lou Will didn't, doesn't have anybody that can set him up for shots. He has to create all his own shots. So I'm giving it to Lou Will just for that, just for that reason alone. So uh, that's, my, that's my sixth man of the year. Defensive player of the year is down to three players. We have Rudy Gobert. Draymond Green, Kawhi Leonard. Um, pretty much, I think it came is down to these last two players. Kawhi might still have a chance to sneak in, but I think it's really down to Draymond and Rudy Gobert. The reason why I'm taking out Kawhi, I mean, the Spurs have a top three. They're number two in defense, if I'm not mistaken. Defensive efficiency and opponents' points uh, allowed per game, only behind the Jazz for points per game allowed, and then efficiency behind Golden State. So, uh, and Kawhi has a lot, of, a lot to do it. Uh, has a lot to do with it, and he pretty much guards almost everybody's best perimeter player. So shooting guard, small forward, he's most likely going to guard you for at least half of the game, if not most of the game, or even the whole game. Every time you're on the court, especially small forwards, man. Um, it depends. So, uh, like, cause I seen the Knicks versus Spurs game. Kawhi wasn't on uh, Melo that much. He was pretty much uh, Danny Green. They was going back and forth on it. So I can't say he always. Guards the best, the best perimeter player, but um, at least seventy-five minimum, he's gonna guard him for that game. Seventy-five percent of the time, he's gonna guard the best player. So, and he's been doing a pretty good job of locking up. And like I said, man, the Spurs, it just shows Spurs defense is pretty great. Now, a lot of people have this argument saying that um, his defensive rating isn't as good as it was last year. But then you also have to take into account when he's on the court. Pal Gasol started. For most of the season, up until he had that injury where he missed a lot of time, and then he came back and Demons kept the spot or whatever the starting job. But Pal Gasol defense was hurting the team. So when you when you're playing with a guy who's not known for any defense, not a great rebound or anything like that, it's kind of hurting your team right there and it's hurting his stats. So, but if you just if you have a, if you watch the game, you know the eyeball test, you'll be able to say, okay, Kawhi's locking his man up. He's doing a pretty good job. And then, of course, Kawhi has the moments. Kawhi has the defensive player of the year moments, like when he blocks James Harden game-winning layup against the Rockets. He took over that game defensively. He's locking Paul George up. He's locking Andrew Wiggins up. He's giving Kawhi, f- I mean, he's giving LeBron fits. He held, he held him to a, like 18 points under 50% shooting and everything like that. He dropped 41 on LeBron and still played great defense on him. So it's just things like that where... It might not just be totally defense, but when you're able to get 
when you're able to average what 20 I think Kawhi is at 26 or 27 right now points per game when you're able to do that and then still lock up on the other end of the court that just give that just gives you that extra like that prowess prowess so uh you have to you have to consider Kawhi but uh Rudy Gobert number one in defensive um, plus minus number one in defensive rating so and he's on a team that's allowing the least amount of points. I will say though, the Jazz play some of the slowest paced basketball, so of course they're gonna they're not, they're gonna be um they're gonna probably allow the least amount of points, but they are great defensively because of him. And he leads almost in every defensive uh category. So you have to consider Gobert, he's blocking a bunch of shots, one of the best rebounders in the NBA. You just have to consider him in the Jazz, like I said, number one uh points per game allowed so number one points per game allowed so uh Rudy Gobert is definitely there and then Draymond Green Draymond Green of course the Warriors not allowing the most amount of uh the least amount of points because they play a fast-paced game so it's probably never going to happen but they are number one in defensive efficiency and I think a lot of that has to do with Draymond Green of course you could say Iguodala and um and Durant had a good big part in that because at one point Kevin Durant was leading that team in blocks per game so but Draymond, when he got injured, they were still the Warriors are still keeping that defense attack, and they actually, I think their defensive numbers improved when KD got injured. So that's that shows you something else. And we all know he's he's not he might not be guarding the best power forwards or whatever because there really isn't there really isn't no elite power forwards for him to guard. But you just watch; it's more of an eye test thing, man. He's getting a bunch of steals, he's getting a bunch of blocks. It's all about defensive position, and he can guard the one through five. Maybe not for a whole game. But he has the ability to do it for stretches. So you got to consider Draymond for that. It's the anchor of that defense. And it's just like, uh, that's like the year Marcus Saul won defensive player of the year. Clearly, he's not the best defensive center. But he's the anchor of the Grizzlies. And I think they were probably like, they're like a top three defense that year. He won it over Tyson Chandler or something like that. So uh, that's pretty much the role Draymond Green is in right now. So you have to you have to consider him there, but for me, my winner, I'm giving it to Draymond Green just because they're the number one defense. You know how hard it is to play at such a fast pace and still be the number one defense in the NBA. So he lays it out, and of course, like I said before, it's all about moments. I've seen Draymond make big, huge stops in the waning moments. Like I know he had a, a block against Schroeder. Uh, I think that would have been the game winner if Schroeder made a layup or something like that. He blocked him against the Hawks. He had one where he ripped Anthony Davis. And he has a few other that I just don't remember all of them. But uh, those are few, the few of them. Uh, oh, excuse me. Those are a few of the moments that I remember where those are big defensive stops, man, that help win games. So you definitely have to consider him there. And Draymond Green also, he's second behind Rudy Gobert in defensive plus minus. So. The stats back it up as well. So, I'm going with Draymond Green. Even though I'm a Kawhi and a Spurs fan, let me give it to Draymond Green. Now, last but not least, we have the Envy. Oh, no. I'm lying. The most improved player. Now, this guy, I'm a, I might be a little biased. My name on Twitter at one point was Nikola Jokic season. But I have to give it to Jokic, man. This guy, he, didn't, he really was fighting for a lot of playing time last year. He couldn't get it because they had too many bigs. Um, free Nurkic, Jokic, Darrell Arthur. So it's kind of it was kind of tough for him to get those minutes. And now this year that he's got minutes in his second year, we have seen him just flourish, man. He has I think he has five triple doubles. Um, he's averaging seventeen points, ten rebounds, five assists a game. And he's I don't even think he's at thirty minutes per game average yet. So uh, if you let him play, if you let him play thirty minutes per game for the whole season. Those numbers might have been a little bit higher, maybe 19, 11, and 6 or 7 or something like that. But uh, this guy's definitely a great player. I look forward to him in the future. He's one of my favorite players right now. Uh, I think probably the best European big man right now. Uh, I wouldn't consider Dirk, but between him and Porzingis, I'm definitely taking him. Taking him over Nurkic, even though Nurkic killed him a few a few weeks ago. And then another guy I've considered for most improved player at one point was Otto Porter Jr., but last two months he's on the down slope. And then Tim Hardaway Jr., who who I also like, man. So uh last year on the Knicks he could barely play the he barely could get any playing time. Really didn't look too good on the Knicks. I went to a few I seen a few games. I live in New York so I seen him play. And then this year he stepped it up on a new on, on another level, man. Maybe it's because of the coaching, but Wooden Hoser comes from the Spurs, you know, family background of coaching. So 
Uh, maybe he just had the right guidance and coaching that he didn't have in New York, but also he just worked harder, I guess. So he's averaging 15 points per game this year on the Hawks. Pretty solid. He comes off the bench. He started a few games as well, but um, I think he's one of the more improved players. A lot of people will say, I've seen people say Harden because he, you know, he turned into a point guard officially. Um, but honestly, when you really think about it, Harden was already doing some of the same things he was doing last year. It's just more that, I mean, yeah, he's passing more, but it's not like he wasn't getting a bunch of double-doubles last year. So, um, I don't know, man, but I guess he's more of a traditional passer where he just scores when he feel like he has to, but he is looking to pass first now. Well, I will give you guys that, but um, he was doing some of these things last year, but hey, I don't know. Who cares? And then Isaiah Thomas, I've seen somebody say that as well, but to be to me... Isaiah Thomas was doing the same things last year. He just didn't get the minutes, and he was coming off the bench. So he didn't have that green light because you got to think about it. He came from Phoenix. Um, I mean, he came, yeah, he, well, he was in Sacramento. We had to play with DeMarcus Cousins, so it wasn't his team. He didn't get to control the team. Then he went to Phoenix. He was behind Eric Bledsoe and Dragic. And then midway through the season, he got traded to to Boston, and that's probably not that easiest transition. It's not your team yet. And now that he's had a full season, he's able to take over as that, you know, the team leader. Probably not the team leader, but the go-to player. So he's had that, he's got that green light this year. So that's probably partly reason why a lot of people are doing that. But I think, man, he's been the same player. It's just that he got the green light now. So, but I guess you could still consider him. And then Giannis, because, uh, Nah, matter of fact, I want to save this for the playoff matchups. I ain't going to talk too much about it. But yeah, Giannis is also considered there too. And then last but not least for the awards, the MVP award. I'm giving it to Westbrook, the best Brook, man. This guy, Westbrook, averaging 31.6 points, 10.4 assists, 10.7 rebounds. This guy is a six foot three guard. Plays on a team full of role players. No floor spacers. Nobody on his team shoots 40% from three. So there's no floor space, and he's still able to get those assists. You know how difficult it is of assists to get. You have to, oh, excuse me. Now difficult it is to get assists when you have no floor spaces and everybody's packing the paint, and they all know what you're trying to do. I mean, yeah, he averages a bunch of turnovers, probably trying to get the assists, force it to his big guys, and everything like that. But uh, still impressive, uh, none the least. So, uh. Westbrook, man, I got to give it to him over Harden. It was pretty much for me, it was between him and Harden. I've seen a few people say Kawhi LeBron, but I'm not even considering those guys, even though I'm a Kawhi fan. But, um, no, nah, he's not in it. It's, it's came down to me between Westbrook and Harden. And a lot of people going to be like, okay, Harden has the better win record. Why does the triple-doubles matter? Like I said, man, when court, Harden plays on a better team, better coaching, better system. So I guess... I guess that's a good reason to give. I guess you can't really hold that. You can't fault him for that. But, like, man, when you're playing with guys like Andre Robinson who can't shoot, Oladipo is a solid player. I give him that. Um, Sabonis, a rookie who's not really, it's not really, he hasn't found his own yet. Got Doug McBuckets who can't really get minutes. Steven Adams, a solid center. I give him that. But he's not a, a goal to score. You can't just, all right, throw the ball in the post. Give me some points right now. You can't do that with him. Then Ennis Cantor is a pretty good player, I'll give you that, but uh, liability on defense. So, a lot of these guys, I don't even know, how, Ola, besides Oladipo, Adams, and Cantor, I don't think a lot of these guys could get much minutes on any other team. So, it's definitely, it definitely, it definitely in favor of Westbrook for me and the most valuable because he's leading his team. Six seed, he lost Durant and Ibaka. You got to give him some credit for that. To to be able to carry this team to the sixth seed in the West, I think they have about 48 wins. It's pretty impressive, man. You lose the rent. It's like it's not like they were prepared to lose him either, man. They had to make some. They had to make some trades. They had to uh, draft around losing the, around losing those guys. So pretty tough right there. So I got to give it to Westbrook Harden. I think he had. I think Harden's averaging around 29, 11, and eight. So 29 points, 11 uh, assists, and 8 rebounds. So it's close to a triple-double. He has about, he has low 20s in the triple-doubles. Westbrook broke Oscar Robertson's record for most triple-doubles in the season. He has 43 right now. And then you see Harden pressing for the, 
pressing for the MVP push, man. He said some salty things. Uh, when they asked about the MVP, he said, I thought it was about winning. Throwing a little shade towards Westbrook. And even though I know they're cool and whatnot, you could tell that he really wants it. So he, you know, tries to throw some little shade over there. But also, man, last night's game, the the Rockets already had the three seed locked up for for like at least two, three games, I think. Now, about three games before this game that they just played. And this guy was out there playing, I think he played 34 minutes just so he can, like, I guess, just have another uh, case for his MVP by getting another triple-double last night. Yeah, that's all cute, man, playing in the last game of the season, playing uh, regular minutes. Now, if he would have got hurt, he would have been stressed out because he was chasing those, I know for a fact, he was chasing those. He was chasing that triple double, man. He wanted to make the last impression. Westbrook only played about 18 minutes, so uh, it didn't really do much. But yeah, man, I'm giving it to Westbrook over Harden. Westbrook has some decent role players, well, with okay coaching, while Harden has a guy who's made two MVP, who has made an MVP. Steve Nash won two of those things in a row with them. Jeremy Lin looked pretty good with D'Antoni. And D'Antoni's always been in a great offensive system. So he's always created a great offensive system for whatever team he's in. So um, that's that's kind of my knock against Harden. So I'm giving it to Westbrook. And I think from there, we can move on to the NBA playoff matchups. For me, we're going to talk about the East first. We got the first seed, Boston versus the AC Chicago. Now, this is where a lot of people will probably kill me. I got Chicago winning in six, man. I don't... This is a gut feeling. I guess I can't prove this. I can't uh, back any of these arguments up to statistically or, I guess, give a logical reason. But, man, Chicago just has that playoff experience. I trust Jimmy Butler. I trust Wade. I trust Rondo in huge moments in the playoffs. I don't know if I trust Isaiah Thomas... Uh, what has he done in the playoffs? Nothing, right? A.V. Bradley, Jay Crowder, Al Hawford. What have any of these guys done in the playoffs? They, hasn't, they haven't had to face a, a calf seed in the Eastern Conference Finals. They haven't went to the Finals. Any of those guys, none of those guys have went to the Finals, man. So in this series, I think it's a potential upset happening in Chicago. Come on, this in six. If you look over the last month and change, Jimmy Butler's put the team on his back when Wade was injured with that elbow. They said he was gonna miss the season, but he came back about three games or two, three games ago. So um, he also had to do this with no shooters. The only shooter Chicago has, maybe you can say, Meritich, but he's more of a streaky shooter. He's not a he's not a forty five percent three point shooter or anything like that. So um, I think that's also where their problems come in too. If they do lose, it's gonna be because they didn't have enough floor spacing, and these guys weren't knocking down open shots or something like that. But uh. Jimmy Butler's been putting the team on his back, so over the past month or so, he's averaging about 24 per game. Wade on the season is averaging 18. Then you just have Rondo, who's a great playmaker and decision decision maker. So uh, I think you take those guys' experience, they have a potential to upset Boston, man. I'm not... I'm not sold on it, man. I won't say I won't say I'm sold on it, but I will. I can see Chicago upsetting them, and I'm picking them to upset Boston in six. So that's my pick there. We also have the number two seed Cavaliers, who dropped from that one seed. They choked it up. They've they've been losing like crazy. Uh, I didn't look it up, but I actually want to check it out now. I want to see what is the Cavaliers' record over the last month or so. We can actually just go look see. What the record is over the last ten games? Because I don't think they've been doing a lot of winning. So th- these guys are four and six in their last game. They're at, they're giving up about 107 points per game. They're bottom ten in in allowed and points allowed and in um defensive efficiency. So that's not great going into the playoffs. They haven't hit their stride. I don't think they have. I don't think they have the chemistry they once had, man. And that defense isn't the same. So it'll be interesting to see how these guys fare against Indiana. Now. I'm not saying Indiana is going to beat them, but those are, that is another uh, series I can see being upset. Let's the refs get into it, and they just like, all right, now nah, we're not having LeBron losing the first round. But I could see Indiana upsetting the Cavs. Paul George for the last month and change from March and April. He's averaging 28 points per game. He started off slow over the first few months. I think he was only averaging about 20. Then notch, he picked it up another notch, and in April he's averaging 32 a game. So they picked up Lance. That's a nice that's a nice pickup for these guys. They need another playmaker, another guy with high energy. 
you know, just a little guy that's going to do some scrappy things, you know, get these teams motivated. He's, he can be like the Draymond in the sense, man, where he's just that high energy. He's going to motivate guys to play with his hard play. So uh, I like Lance I like Lance Stevenson. They also have Al Jefferson. He's not going to probably play much minutes. Give you 15 minutes a game. So, <coughs> excuse me, give you about 15 about 15 minutes a game, probably get you eight and four in that time. But it's just a consistent. You just need a consistent bench in the playoffs. Which the Cavaliers bench, they did pick up some guys, but let's say the kind of wash now. Like you look at Darren Williams, you looked at uh, Shannon Fry. I mean, he can knock down. He can knock down a few threes. You got Kyle Korver, who's a sharpshooter. But when you see those guys, none of those guys play defense. So. That would be the interesting. That's going to be the interesting uh, key there because you got Paul George. I still look at him as a great defender. He's not going to lock LeBron up, but you need somebody that can slow him down. I can see him slowing the LeBron down a little bit. I'm not going to say he's going to even. LeBron is still going to get you 25, 8, and 8 on almost every night in the playoffs. But as long as you can keep him from exploding, I think you have a chance. And I think Paul George can keep LeBron from exploding here if he really clamps down. I don't know if. I mean. Paul George probably doesn't have the strength to really slow LeBron down that much, but I think quickness and laterally he can do a little bit. So, uh, I got Cavs winning in six, but I wouldn't be surprised if Indiana wins the series. Honestly, I just I just wouldn't be surprised. So, uh, next we have Raptors versus Milwaukee. I think this game is gonna be a wash. I have a few people tell me that they think Milwaukee can upset the Cavs or get to the East Conference Finals. I'm not rolling. I'm not rolling. I am not rolling. I think the Raptors win this four zip. I respect Giannis. He led the. He was top twenty in almost every key stat. He was top twenty in points, top twenty in rebounds, top twenty in assists, top twenty in steals, and top twenty in blocks. So that tells you he's one heck of a player, and he's still improving. A uh, great lengthy player, six what six eleven wingspan, freaking look like Shaq. So um, not even Shaq. So I don't. I don't know the numbers, but uh, yeah, super lengthy dude can really change the game on both ends of the floor. So I mean, if somebody to be top twenty in steals and blocks and rebounds, this land, you know what he's he does. He's doing it all. So uh, and he's also top twenty. He's also top twenty in points. So this guy's a pretty good player. Pretty much can guard the one through five, if you ask me. So most versatile player. So. Uh, but I just I just can't see them being the Raptors, man. They got Cal Lowry, Demar Derozan, Demary Carroll, Serge Ibaka, Jonas Valanciunas, P.J. Tucker, Norman Powell. I feel like that team's a little got a got a, they got some uh, guys that've been there before. Corey Joseph, and just just last year the Raptors were in the Eastern Conference Finals, so um, they picked up a few nice pieces. I think they'll be back there again, if you ask me. Um, they're gonna well, they probably can't because they're gonna have to play the Cavs in the next round if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure if the two and the three play. Each other. Yeah, they yeah they will. They have to play the Cavs in the next round if they both those guys advance. So, um, probably won't be in the Eastern Conference Finals again. But uh, that is a team I can see up playing the Cavs actually. But uh, I just have them up. I just have them sweeping Milwaukee for zip. Now we can pretty much move on to Washington versus Atlanta. Now Atlanta is one of those teams that they just. Like, you look at them, nothing stands out about their play, but they're just one of those solid teams that just get it done. It's almost like the Spurs team. But I don't see who they have to take over games. I mean, Paul Millsap's a pretty good player. You got, like I said, I like Tim Hardaway Jr. this year, one of the most improved players. Dennis Schroeder's improved a little bit, but that's going to be the X factor right there. Dennis Schroeder, man, if he can't stop turning the ball over and can't be efficient enough offensively, these guys don't even have a chance again against Washington. I know they're great defensively. They're a top five defense. But, like I said, man, I think they're going to have a lot of struggles on offense. And I just don't see where they're going to get consistent offense from. So, I'm going with Washington in five or maybe six. I, I'm teetering on that. So, But I definitely have Washington in six no matter what. So, we can, I guess we could pretty much move on to the western side of the things. I'm gonna save the uh the, probably the most the most exciting matchup last, which you know Golden State versus Portland. I'm gonna start with L.A. versus Utah. I'm gonna be the first to say this. Jazz and seven. 
I don't know. This is another one of my gut feelings. I don't have any stats to prove this. I just have a feeling like Jazz going to upset these guys. Clippers have been underperforming. These guys can't get past the second round for nothing. And I think these guys get eliminated this round. I don't know why. I just feel like Utah, they're pretty great defensively. They're not going to be able to bully Utah. What, DeAndre Jordan? You got you cancel him out with Gobert. Blake Griffin, you cancel him out with a healthy Derek Favors. I don't know if Derek Favors is going to stay healthy this whole series, but I'm just assuming he's healthy right now. So you got him canceled out. They're going to get physical with these guys. Um... Gordon Hayward's improved his play, man. He, he's a free agent at the end of the season, so you know he's gonna be playing. For, he's gonna be playing for something right now. So besides just the playoffs, he's he's playing to get that bag. So uh, he's gonna play his heart out. You got Ronnie Hood. Then you got Georgia. I think these guys they're, they're top three defense as well. So I just think, and if you look at a lot of Jazz games, there's games where the final score will end like. 85 to 87 or something like that, where teams are not even scoring 90. And I think if you get the Clippers out that offensive rhythm, the Jazz can come by and sneak sneak out a win, man, sneak out this series. So uh, I just have the Jazz in seven. It might not sound as logical as you guys would want it to, but I just got them upsetting these guys. Spurs in Memphis, Spurs in five. I'm a Spurs fan, so it might be a little biased. But I just feel like Memphis doesn't have enough uh, firepower, Kawhi. Gonna be pretty consistent. They don't really have anybody to guard him. I guess Tony Allen, but I think he's too small to guard Kawhi, honestly. He's just gonna post him up, fade away, post up, hook shot. So, um, and then our bench is gonna blow their benches out. They're, our bench is gonna blow their bench out the water. It's gonna play off time. Um, Houston OKC. I have I have OKC upset Houston at six. Don't. This is another. This is another one of those things, man. I just okay. I guess I'm going with the teams that play a little better defense. So, OKC, if I'm not mistaken, they're top 10 in defensive efficiency. I'm not sure if they're top 10 in um, opponents' points allowed per game. But if I, I know for sure they're definitely top 10 in defensive efficiency. Houston likes to play at that fast pace. And I don't think you want to get into a track meet with these guys. Now, I know I said Harden's team is way better than OKC's. But I just feel like this is this mo- this is the moment that... Westbrook's gonna take the challenge, show everybody, show everybody why he's the MVP. I just think he's gonna he's gonna put on for these guys. And yes, uh, OKC is actually 10th in defensive efficiency, while Houston is 18th. So uh, that tells you all you need to know. They both play up in pace, so it's probably gonna be a lot of points scored. But I think I just think OKC is gonna get timely stops in that series, and they're gonna be Houston at six. Uh, don't kill me for that. Then last but not least, we got the most exciting first round matchup of the playoffs, Golden State versus Portland. And I just got I wanna say this. I feel like Portland can upset them, but I'm just not gonna pick them to upset them. I got Golden State in six. Lillard's gonna have a few explosive games where he probably scores about forty. But I just think Portland, their guards don't play enough defense. I know Curry's gonna get exposed this series because he can't hide on defense. But but um McCollum and uh, Lily don't play any defense as well. So, if you also have Golden State, they won the margin of their games by 17 points. They were the number one offensive and the number one defensive efficiency team in the NBA. So, I just can't see them losing in the first round. They just got too much firepower. The best defensive team and the best offensive team. So, it's kind of hard to pick them to lose the series. But, I do like this matchup for Portland a little bit, man. Just because... If you if if Lillard gets hot and McCollum gets hot, this could be a long series. We got to see if Nurkic is gonna come back healthy. Who knows what his situation is right now? But um, if he doesn't even play in this series, they have no chance. But if he's if he comes back and he's healthy, they might have a little bit of chance. Uh, we'll see if he get if he has his win back together in the first few games. If he does play, but um, yeah, man, I just got Golden State winning. I just can't see them losing in the first round. But um. That's about it for today. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this first episode of my podcast. More will come. I'll talk about a few of these other games. I'll probably have some more MLB and NFL notes in the next week's episode if something important happens. So that being said, I'm out of here. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Like, subscribe, man. Rate this on iTunes. Do all of that. So uh, appreciate all the love and I'm out of here. Peace.